appreciate your time and attention today. As we get started talking about cascade care, we will uh, try to do some introductions. I think it might be more practical to speak with the folks in the room. I know we have quite a few listening on the webinar. Um, and I believe we've got unmuted at this point, so they couldn't introduce themselves anyway. <laughs> Bear with us as we stumble through this together. Obviously, we haven't re re rehearsed at all. Um, my name is Michelle Needham. I'm from the Healthcare Authority. I'm the Chief Policy Officer. And, uh, <coughs> a team of people that we've been working with with the Health Benefit Exchange as well to develop the testing for our product. Um, so we'll go ahead and start some introductions. So I'll turn to Ben first. Hi, I'm Ben Dieterich. I'm an actuary with Nolan. I've worked with the Healthcare Authority since 2006. Mostly on the PEV program and most recently on the SED school employee program. And now I'm helping out on this Washington Cascade Care project. Hi, I'm Rachel Quinn, uh, Special Assistant uh, in the Policy Division of the Shelby. Hi, I'm Clinton Moore, an actuary with Regents. I'm Kevin Curley, an actuary with Regents. Uh, Zach Alden, also with Regents, I use support exchanges. Hi, I'm Melinda Hughes from Kaiser Permanente. I lead the individual market for the region. Simon Vismantis, I'm on the government relations team of Kaiser Permanente. Andrea Davis, coordinated care. Amy Peach with the Washington State Office of Insurance Commissioner. Uh, Jeff Overly, expert with the Washington OIT Hi, Christine Javert with the Exchange. Hi, Sam Pagowski with the Exchange. Leah Hull Marshall, General Counsel and Chief Strategist for the Exchange. Lane Crony with Claudia St. Clair, Molina Healthcare. Uh, Brian Blasco with Molina Healthcare. Molly, Molly Morris with the exchange. All right, thank you all. And I'm sorry, we can't catch your names on the phone, but I, I do have your registration so we know who's participating. Um, I didn't make myself a sure, so unfortunately you're just going to have to do my first name. Well, uh, our goal today, obviously, is just to do a, a brief introduction of um, topics that we hope you've been following with the exchange for discussions with stakeholder groups, but I know we've got an extended group as well today with some of the actual support from the carriers. And um, we will have a deep dive with Ben to go over a lot of the methodology before we dive into that discussion, and we hope to have a, a detailed discussion with you after the slides are presented. I should Say is that footnote is going that we are recording this presentation of the slides, and at some point we will stop recording and terminate that so we can have a active discussion in the room. Before we turn over to Ben, we thought we would have the exchange to a brief recap of the standard benefit design and the next steps for that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to ask if I can be heard, if those of you on the phone can hear me. If not, I will move. Or the microphone will come to me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so, yes, uh, we will keep it brief, but just wanted to recap um, all the work you have been doing with us over the last several months um, to develop a standard plan for use in the Cascade Care public option uh, for 2021. And first wanted to start off with really thanking all of you so much for your very active engagement throughout this whole process. We've gotten so much uh, kind of necessary feedback from you um, that have influenced the plan designs, and we really appreciate that. Um, we, the exchange board met last week and approved the plan designs. <laughs> you all have uh, a version of the plan designs that have been approved. Um, those of you in the room, I think you have this in your packet. Um, those of you on the phone have received it. We just wanted to kind of highlight again, um, since we have had many versions of the plan, where we ended up with the three final standard plans, um, one gold, one silver, and one bronze. Um, and then you have kind of a, a summary of the plan designs, which just shows you the deductible kind of at the top, the maximum out of pocket, and then the cost sharing for the services that we have standardized for 2021. Um, as mentioned, the Exchange Board approved these plans last week, and at this point, the plans will be turned over to HBA to be included in their procurement for the public option for 2021. Um, as you all know, we also will be receiving guidance from CMS 
later in the winter, um, which will you know, impact the actuarial value calculator, and we will then be adjusting the plans as needed to make sure they're still meeting these actuarial values that we've ended up with for each metal level. Um, we'll be continuing discussions with you as we receive that guidance, as we tweak the plans, and let you all know kind of where the final plans end up. Um, and of course, we'll be continuing to meet with you on an ongoing basis through the plan certification work group um, to continue talking about this plan design and then to you know, look forward to 2021 um, participation in the exchange. I think that's all. <laughs> Are there any other questions for us at this point as we kind of wrap up the standard plan design and hand it over for the discussion on public option? All right, again, thank you all for your engagement and feedback throughout the process. Thank you.
then your primary care can go under 160%, but it can't go any lower than 135%. <laughs> and Healthcare Authority has on their website enabling legislation that shows what the definition of primary care services are. So that should, you know, will, will. So that should be pretty straightforward. We've got the link to the bill 5526 there on the side if anyone cares to read the full detail. So that context, so we started off in November, we had an initial data call that we sent out to carriers. If you all are interested, there's still time to participate in using your data to inform the public comment. What we're able to do within the scope of this work is to take an individual claim data file from you, process it within the processing methodology that we would use to assign Medicare prices similar for Cascade Care, and give a return file to use so that you know how the Medicare price was determined on real live actual claims. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So I just want to make a comment. In the legislation, there is language that um, includes the data request, uh, not the data, the data exercise from, it, from our public disclosure process. So those, I don't know, I think most are familiar with our public disclosure process in the state, but we have um, kind of immunity under this bill to that this will not be subject to public disclosure. So I wanted to point that out because we've heard um, some questions from some um, carriers. So if you're participating in the data request, you'll get back from us what the Medicare allowed amount is that is assigned to every claim. And that then serves as the denominator in the calculation for percentage of Medicare. The numerator is going to be whatever contracted amount you've negotiated on an allowed basis with every provider. So that's going to be a given off of your historical data. It's going to be an unknown when we get to the structure of the procurement. And at some point, it's going to then become a known value when we're at the validation phase to go back and compare how your actual experience emerged relative to these targets. So just to, re yeah. Do you want to Yeah, no, now it's fine. The return file is that like at a criminal line level? Yes. Okay. So at the claim line level, we then have to total everything up to assess the percentage of Medicare. And just to remind everyone that when we do that, a dollar weighted average, so it's somewhat complicated when you're talking about percentage of Medicare analysis because we're messing with both the numerator and you all are messing with or you all are controlling the numerator, we're all controlling the denominator. So when we're going through and we're assigning Medicare amounts to all the various claim details, how we're coming up with that Medicare logic is a critical component to then measuring the effectiveness of your contract levels relative to that. So when we try to assign Medicare to every claim line, there's quite a few issues that we can quickly run through on the bullets for the slide that we just have to think through. And we, we realized that we didn't ask for national provider on our initial data call back in November. So at some point, we're going to have to update and revise that. Um, you need national provider identifier to assess the area. An area is an important component of some of the Medicare fee schedules. And then you also have to be able to identify the Medicare provider ID. And those are two additional fields that we need to make sure we're probably going to eventually have to get right. I think for the initial data call, we're probably able to make do with what we have. The last thing is that in order to assign Medicare for the those hospitals that are paid cost, you have to do a calculation of a cost to charge ratio. We'll get into that a little bit more into the future slides, but I'm not sure how much familiarity we have in the room or on the phone in terms of what the cost to charge calculation is, but it takes a long settlement time for that data to be realized. So what we're planning to do for Cascade Care so that you all can move forward in your efforts of contracting with providers is we plan to eventually publish what we will be using as the 2021 cost to charge ratio for every facility. So that will be hopefully a known value before we get into the 2021 period. It's just too much time is required for us to assess the true cost to charge ratio in 2021. That would probably not happen until 2023. So we'll, we'll just bump that up and then we'll make some assumptions about charge trend relative to cost trend. So just getting into quick the next slide, 
front is the overview of what fee schedule year we're selecting. So in addition to all the complexities of identifying what provider type is, corresponds to what fee schedule, we also have uh, the federal government changing Medicare prices on an annual basis. And they change inpatient facility cost fee schedules on a federal fiscal year basis. And then they have occasion to do interim updates over the course of a federal fiscal year. And then they set the outpatient facility and the physician fee schedules on a calendar year basis. So this is just to clear up, we will be using for the inpatient facility, the fee schedule that's in effect on October 1st of the year prior to the effective date. So the first year of evaluation for Cascade Care will be 2021. <laughs> the hospital fee schedule that we'll be using for the inpatient side will be that one that is effective October 1st, 2020. I have a question on that. So why, if, if the fee schedule is updated, why don't you use the later one? Uh, it's just all about time and it's trying to give you guys the opportunity to know what basis you're contracting on is going to be the same basis that you ultimately get evaluated on. So we only have three months lead time for you, but it's the best we could probably work with. I was just thinking because we're working with data that is from 2016. So on an apples to apples basis, wouldn't you be using a piece of data that was maybe in effect at the beginning of the metal period? So it's the federal fiscal year. So October 1st, 2017 is going to run through September 30th, 2018. So we can price on a data surface. It's possible for our programming to handle that. It's just, I think, easier for communication not to have that unknown last three months of the year. So we've got nine months of overlap effective in 2018 with the Medicare reimbursement methodology. And we just figure that's better than trying to price for the whatever Medicare increase or decrease could happen for the last three months of the year. Oh, sure. So the question was, why would we take something sooner in the calendar year relative to the year that we're evaluating? You know, we just discussed the nine months. So next slide. I have a little bit more of a general question, but it's, it's, it's kind of related to that. Um, so big picture, we're hearing this measurement on our historical data to say how far our current base person rate away from one to make care. When carriers, I have participated for uh, Cascade Care 2021. I call it a validation. Validation. What what is the so what happens, for example, if the results say this carrier was at 165% of Medicare? What, what is there? So haven't quite figured all that out yet. But you've got that from the high level. The question was, how is the timing going to operate? And there will be a validation period ultimately of your 2021 Cascade Care experience yeah. to be certain that that was with those criteria that we're trying to specify in a procurement during 2020. So we're right. procuring off of a future state that we don't necessarily know. But yes, there will be a validation phase at some point in the 2022 timeframe. Okay. I think the reason I'm thinking about it with respect to the time that the fee schedule is if, for example, CMS increases the rates for the last three months of that calendar year, but you measure it on a fee schedule that doesn't capture that, then by definition, the denominator would be a little bit lower, and therefore the results would be a little bit higher. <coughs> if there's some sort of penalty or, you know, it's a one-sided sort of measurement where if you're below 160, that's good, and if you're above, that's bad. Yep. So it's being poor, results being worse than they otherwise would be. Right, so I think the important piece in the consideration of when you set that provider contract in advance of 2021, because you're procuring now, yeah, that you want to tie that contract in to whatever that published fee schedule is going to be right. for that first nine months. Yeah, so that then when we do the validation, we're validation, we're validating using the same fee schedule timing and consideration yeah. that you actually signed the contract with the providers. That's 
So at the end of the day, it should have been washed out. That makes sense. I think by and large, most contracts were tied to Medicare, but there will always be some that may not necessarily. And you've got to consider that in your margin, right? Like, yep. you guys are responsible for negotiating the total network. Yep. And then that total network is what we will ultimately be validating against. So it's the expectation that then contracting would be kind of blindly tied to it, because certainly at the time we're negotiating networks and contracts, even the 20, the, the FY2021 will so be never published. Yep. Yeah, we're we're negotiating right. way more than three months. Yep. So you've got to take that into consideration. I don't think, I don't have any expectations about how to handle that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just message the issue. So now we'll get into the, the first main pricing category, fee schedule category in our methodology is prospective payment. I would categorize this as the lion's share bulk, uh, probably close tie with RBRBS that we'll be talking about later. So the inpatient prospective payment system, we will go through and review the claims that have a room and board revenue code associated with them. We will be using, for our analysis, the Melanin Health Cost Guidelines Grouper. It automatically does a lot of these category of service classifications. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's any sort of restriction on how you need to assess where you think your performance is going to be. So it's always important to make sure that when you're reviewing the document, the report that we've issued, that you feel like it's a transparent enough method that you yourself could eventually validate the results that we will be providing on a percentage of Medicare basis. Once we've identified those inpatient claims, we then identify if the provider is paid on a PPS schedule. That PPS schedule is an index of weight at the MSDRG level and a conversion factor that's specific to the facility. Once you do that calculation that kind of sets the case rate of reimbursement for the inpatient stay, then we do an assessment of what the Medicare outlier provisions would be, and we apply that outlier adjustment to the claim as well. So if we have any claims that don't have valid NPI codes, that's the National Provider Identification Code, we will then assume the default Medicare reimbursement amount. We're kind of toying with this. We may assume the average. Uh, it just depends on how we want to handle all these sort of little data widgets. Are there any questions on inpatient facilities? All right, moving on to the next slide, we have the next part of prospective payment, which is the outpatient prospective payment system, or OPS. <laughs> OPS is then identifying any claim that is a revenue code or facility type that will fall under the fee schedule. So there's an outpatient payment system for facilities, and then there's also an outpatient payment system for ambulatory surgical centers. These are the two main places of service where this method of reimbursement would apply. Now, for diagnosis code on inpatient, we have the parallel for code on outpatient, and the procedure code will be used to identify what the fee schedule reimbursement is for every hospital or every facility and for every ambulatory service center. Again, the NPI code is used to make an area adjustment. So if we don't have an NPI code in the instance of outpatient, we will be making a Seattle assumption for that area factor. And then the ancillary fee schedules get incorporated into the processing of outpatients. So if there's any clinical laboratory or any RBRBS, codes that we're going to talk about in a minute for physical therapy, all those are processed at the claim line level, and if you're participating in the data call, we'll get returned to you of what the Medicare assigned prices were for each. Now, when it comes to outpatient and really anything procedural code-based, Medicare does not necessarily cover every possible procedure code that you could be facing. So, for those few services, that's where we'll be invoking the enabling legislation of similar service. So we will go through and we will have to make a publication 
based upon either what data you submit to us during the data call or based upon other data sources that we've seen through healthcare authorities, public employee benefit program or school employee benefit program, we will eventually have to publish for those procedure codes that do not map to a HCPCS service that is covered by Medicare, what the similar service is that we will be using. We're hoping that the fallout for those procedure codes that don't map directly to Medicare is gonna be relatively small. Next slide. So the next slide is uh, the final of the prospective payment method, and that's the professional fee schedule, which is also called the Resource-Based Relative Value System, or RBRBS. And we identify professional claims as those claims that either have no revenue code or one of the revenue codes that are listed on the slide. Medicare amounts, like I said earlier, get assigned based upon the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System that Medicare uses, also called the HICS fix code, and the fee schedule year that's under evaluation. There's lots of different professional fee schedules that we're going to be evaluating. The main one is the RBRBS that applies to professional services. And then we also have all those that are listed below, the main one being clinical lab, also DME, or ambulance and anesthesia. And then we also have the Part B drug fee schedule that's delivered to a professional set. So right now, as of now, we're excluding the retail pharmacy component, and we will probably have to eventually have a discussion that Part B drugs are going to be part of the exclusion for pharmacy shopping. For now, everything's in. <coughs> Next slide we can go to is the Medicare pricing methodology for those facilities that are under a cost reimbursement relationship with Medicare. So that includes your cancer hospitals, children's hospital, uh, old community hospital, and critical access hospital. Now, Seoul Community Hospital, you should probably put a little asterisk next to that. That's not currently reimbursed by Medicare on a cost basis, but our enabling legislation lumps all rural hospitals to be inclusive of Seoul Community Hospitals and critical access hospitals. So those hospitals are reimbursed at their relative cost. In order to do that, we will need, like I said earlier, to publish what the cost to charge ratio is for these various facilities that we're planning to reimburse. And that cost to charge ratio will be multiplied by either 100% in the case of cancer and children's hospitals or 101% for critical access hospitals in order to determine the, determine the amount of Medicare assignment. So just to review the long timeline of delay for the CCRs, the CCR published in 2018 really relates to the settlement cost settlement activities of 2016. And so for that reason, because there is so much time and reporting of the cost reports for Medicare, we're likely going to be two years in arrears for that. But we will use whatever the most currently available published schedule is before the effective date. Now, we weren't able to get all of the providers priced out for Medicare in the time frame that we had to develop this methodology. So there are still a few that we're working on. So the report that got distributed doesn't have any of the underlying appendices that would have the analysis to represent what the cost to charge ratio is or what the similar service substitution is. So that shouldn't hinder you at all in reporting back and giving your comments and feedback on the methodology. I think our methodology is pretty clear in how we're proposing to assign the Medicare prices and we welcome the feedback on that. For those, there's a handful of hospitals that are either PPS or CCR that we're likely going to be moving to a CCR approach, just to be clear. And that includes the psychiatric hospitals, rehabilitation centers, long-term care facilities, hospital facilities, and skilled nursing facilities. So those, we think, based upon our review of the public employee plans, are relatively small and also shouldn't really hinder what the overall size of the Medicare amounts are for your claim space. If we see something as we're going through and processing that initial data call that makes us think to the contrary, we can definitely revisit if there's a more uh, 
readily available method of pricing those sorts of facilities out other than the CPR approach. The next slide uh, lists to the exclusions that we're currently considering on our Medicare pricing methodology. So right now in our Medicare method, we are not including any of the following additional payments that Medicare might make in order to reflect specific policy goals. Some of these payments that are listed on the exclusion list are difficult to recognize as a percentage adjustment to the base rate of a PPS payment, for example. Yes. Oh, one more slide, Tamara, I'm sorry. The other way. There we go. That's it. Oh. The one that says exclusion. Yes. Yes. So we're not making adjustments for indirect medical education payments, IME the disproportionate share hospital payments and uncompensated care payments. Those are probably the two biggest components of add-ons that Medicare would include in their reimbursement. We're also not reducing any of the Medicare reimbursement for sequestration. Medicare does some very specific claim edits that we're not able to replicate. Then there's bundled payments and risk sharing that could impact Medicare reimbursement, as well as capital payments for new hospitals, inpatient new technology payments. Then we have the physician health professional shortage area payments and the physician incentive payment adjustments like either the merit-based incentive payment system or MIT. Ben, I, I understand why you would want the first draft to consider a lot of very complicated um, payment methods for Medicare. Uh, I'm wondering, going back to the question earlier where you know, the way the methodology we define will determine the numerator. Um, do you have a sense for, like some of these are obviously going to increase the same rates for Medicare, IME-ish, um, others would decrease the administration. Have you guys done any sort of assessment on the net of all of these adjustments, whether there's an increase in the We haven't done the net. Sorry, the question is, have we done any analysis on the net impact of all these exclusions? We have not. There are some slides later, I believe, yep, that do touch on the first two. So the IME and the DISH and uncompensated care payments, we have, we're, we are able to compensate that or correct for that, okay. but we haven't done everything in total. Okay. So you say you are correct? We're not currently in the proposed methodology. Okay. We're welcoming feedback on that. Okay. The balance being affordability. So every time we're pushing up that denominator of Medicare reimbursement, we're raising the price of what the legislature was trying to attain. I agree with that. I also think in practice, how providers are actually contracting with carriers. Yep. And if they assume that those type of specific payments methodologies are part of a Medicare payment rate, it's not necessarily increasing the price, it's just part of the normal course of business yep. for how carriers you know. Right. I think I second that. That will mean we're not getting all the reimbursement in the denominator. On the Which, and I think some of these are pluses, some of them are minuses, and that's yeah. what I was kind of trying to take over the net impact. So we can go to the next slide, number 12. So there are some data quality exclusions as well. So everything that we just talked about from an exclusionary standpoint for Medicare additions or subtractions to the payments that they're making to the individual providers. We do also have some limitations on our ability to process your data to assess what the Medicare amount would be. So when we see that if we get any individual claims in the individual market that have claims for members over age 65, we're planning to exclude those from data consideration. Also, any claim that has a coordination of benefits adjustment. So these 
two pieces here would be great places to get your feedback on as to whether or not that's a reasonable approach to measuring the individual market. We also do some financial checks for making sure that the claims data is reasonable and consistent, and those would be things like build or allowed amounts less than a dollar, allowed or build ratios greater than a 2.0 or less than a 0 0.03, and within the report we list out further what the data quality exclusions are going to be. Our hope would be that when we get to the final validation process and we're getting real live data off of Cascade Care participants, that we would be able to work through and resolve hopefully the majority of these data quality issues and that we would have data that it is able to be truly validated against the metrics that we're trying to measure. And I think to your first point on the, um, the first two exclusions, we're anticipating that this is a very tiny percent. So if you all have information that would suggest otherwise, I think that is I mean, any information is great, but that would be especially important to us. So that's, that's our current assumption. Just to repeat for those on the phone, if anyone has an additional feedback to give on exclusion for members over age 65 or excluding individual claims that have COB adjustments, our current expectation is both of those are going to be very small for an individual market plan. Now that we've kind of rolled through a high-level overview of our Medicare pricing, there are two categories of services that have potential alternatives to Medicare. And this is probably to some of the points Brian's been making. When you're contracting today with facilities, you may make adjustments to some of the services that Medicare has a published fee schedule for, but aren't really relatively appropriate for an underage, non-aged, underage 65 population. So the main one of those is maternity and newborn. So for maternity and newborn services, we would propose an alternative approach for consideration of using the Department of Veterans Affairs TRICARE weights. These weights are established and publicly available relative to the MSCRG weight. So you don't have to change any conversion factors, you don't have to change any outlier payment methodology, all you're simply doing is informing the relative weight off of an under age 65 population as opposed to the Medicare published MSD or G weight. The other one is the services that we described earlier for small community hospitals. They're actually paid on a prospective payment system, so they have an if factor that reflects that they are a small community hospital. And so this is a little gap in the legislation that we've got to figure out how we're going to cross where we could potentially price the sole community hospitals out at their PPS and true Medicare rate and then go back and double verify that that is also greater than 101% of cost. We're still working through that. All right, moving on to slide 14. So here we have some preliminary results using the public employee data set where we've run through and priced their claims using a methodology similar but not quite with all the bells and whistles to Cascade Care but we've at least been able to assess two key components. That's the with add-on payments that we discussed earlier, so the IME dish uncompensated care add-on or the TRICARE maternity weight substitution. So in both instances, this was trying, chart, trying to give you off of a generic commercial population what the relative shift in the percentage of Medicare might look like off of those two sort of open points. So full Medicare, no add-on payment of 170.6% would be most akin to the base case of what we are proposing in the report right now. So what you're proposing in the report right now is the situation 
without add on payment. Like without add on payment okay. and without uh, TRICARE week. I'm looking for your feedback. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously, on inpatient, it's a 40% differential. It's very material. 5% overall, but that's, that's significant. This is helpful. Does answer the question? Good. All right, we can move to the next slide tomorrow. So this is the same PEV data set to try and get you an idea of at least through that data where we've made no effort to improve the data quality exclusion, how much of the services are currently not being able to be assigned a Medicare price. Now there's two critical components of cascade care that we have not yet executed on the PEV pricing, and that is to substitute similar services. So there's two footnotes at the very bottom of the slide. The similar services are 81% of the not assigned of allowed cost. So if you go down the allowed column, we have $59.72 of assigned of not assigned TMPM -TM services, and these are on a true cost basis, and that's 16% of the grand total. So we're getting 84% Medicare assignment, and we expect that of the $59.72, once we do the similar service analysis to substitute those HCPCs that are not covered directly by Medicare, that will go down by $48.50. The other key piece of logic that Cascade Care will have that this preliminary analysis doesn't have is the correction for when NPIs are going to be defaulted for geographic area analysis or if we're not able to recognize the Medicare provider ID. And that would sweep up 14 more percent of the not assigned on an allowed basis or another $8.24. So that really leaves us with uh, about 5639 out of 5972 in allowed cost that is just remaining for data quality issues. So we're hoping to see similar results, or at least that's our expectation, is to be able to get similar results out of whoever's ultimately participating in Cascade Care so that we think that this methodology should be enough that we are validating the most highest percentage, if not all of the claims that you would have actually experienced under the program. So that concludes the quick overview of the presentation side. Do we want to do we have the phone lines open for questions? Can people type up on the phone if they have yeah, anything? Um I guess, could you raise your hand if you have a question, and then um, Tamara, who is operating the webinar from Olympia, can unmute you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. If you have a question, I'm going to unmute you. <laughs> um, are there concerns about making adjustments and just using carriers to make data that that incentivizes and rewards for selection that carriers that have a higher percentage of? Professional services will find it much easier to meet the 160 target on validation versus carriers that aren't have a high risk. Or yeah. or You've got a, definitely a consideration. We don't have any solutions for you right now. So, so at this the point, provider mix, the provider mix, the category mix, all those sorts of issues are what we're wrangling with in order to get to a statewide goal. So at this point, you're envisioning evaluating each carrier's data on its own as opposed to evaluating, say, the total cascade, or is that something you haven't even, yet? haven't even decided that yet. Right now, we're really just focused on what the basis of evaluation would be, and then we can go forward with, okay, now that we have the basis of Medicare assignment for every claim, how are we going to group this together to achieve the objective? I would add, and then you can correct me if I'm not tracking properly. But I think the, the goal right now in this phase of the discussion with all of you is to provide enough information that we can help you, then can help you 
this case, maybe um, get comfortable with your methodology so that you're prepared to do a filing with OAC and then seek a procurement with us. You can do that right now with so those components, but um, maybe helping you get prepared to do that portion of the process. Well, that's a big question we've had discussions about is how you do a prospective look to support the rate filing, give OIC what they need, give a digital very time. retrospective yeah. validation. Yeah. Yeah. Without very one sided. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the results of that evaluation would weigh heavily into our decisions on kind of risk and reward and participation. I guess you know we're talking about effectively making a cost component of rate development. Exactly. So how does this entire project relate to the development of this whole premium rate cascade here? I, I don't know very much about this program at the moment, so I'm just curious about how are the total premium rates supposed to be set. Um, I would consider this three somewhat parallel tracks where HBE with the standard benefit design right. kind of got started first laying that foundation. Now we're kind of going second to lay the foundation of how the unit cost component is going to be. Right. And then yes, all the standard OIC approaches of their final rate package and rate review templates, they're all going to happen just like they always do under that same timeline. And then we've got to figure out from the healthcare authority perspective are there any pieces of that process that we then actually have to pull back concurrently into the procurement of the network on the unit cost side yeah. to make sure that we've considered everything on a relative basis? I guess it's, it's, it's a lot of unknowns in this. And you think about the ultimate goal is to provide a product that's affordable. Yep. That's what we're saying. That's why there's these constraints on the cost. Um, and there's a keen focus on making sure the reverse rates um, don't go above certain levels. Um, but at the same time, total cost for a program can depend on how well the organization is managed. And so if one is a, if result is 170% of Medicare, but utilization comes in lower than what it would have been under a very low rate, you know, we can manage it and total cost is going to go lower. So I'm just trying to figure out how the how the you know, cost side will fit into the true measurement of cost for the program. I think we're all trying to figure that out as we go along. Okay. I don't think anyone's connected all the pieces okay. to say that, oh, if we pull this lever of standard benefit design, yeah, that's gonna drive X. If we pull this lever of standardizing unit costs or putting in market constraints on unit costs, that's going to drive Y. Right. And oh, if we get an effective rate review process, that's going to give us Z on top and everyone's going to be happy and the legislature will be the one. Right, because then you've got selection issues, you've got kind of legal issues, you have carrier. Okay. Are you envisioning that this methodology will be published in a way that carriers can replicate it internally to what like what DMS does with risk adjustment? Um, yep. That's what our hope is that this report will eventually be. So this draft report right now, it doesn't have any of the appendices that you would need to truth replicate it, but it should have enough of a methodology description that you should be ready to, to try and replicate it. So that leads to another question. You mentioned health test guidelines. Yep. What if a carrier doesn't have access to a health test guideline tool? For whatever reason, they've chosen yep. not to purchase them. Is right. it something they can still do? Should be. I mean, it's revenue code based. It's diagnosis code based. I mean, there's Medicare repricers out there that people may want to tap into. That that's all they do is you needed a claim detail and it fits out what the Medicare prices is. So you'd have to be responsible for configuring that Medicare repricer correctly so that it matches the description that we've gone through here. But we're going to use our technologies to do the repricing just because that's the easiest for us to do. We're not going to build anything from scratch that's then going to be publicly released. But we wouldn't release like a SAS code package that would do the repricing for you. But the idea
idea is that the report should be transparent enough that you can replicate it on your own if you choose. I think the one part of the tool that sticks out to me is the last step where you um, you found ways to reprice claims that don't get a Medicare review schedule, some of which rely on the proprietary limited relative value unit methodology. Um, is that simply like a map? Yeah. Okay. So we'll use the Milliman Global RVUs to assess the relative intensity. Yes. And we'll publish your service A substituted for service B, and you can go execute that map. Okay. Or you can present to us research that you've done on your own that says that service B is crazy. That is not the right substitute for service A. And then we can adjust within the appendix to say, all right. We're all agreed now that service B is going to map over to service B. And then that becomes the published amount. I mean, eventually, you all are having to execute some provider contract that represents whatever you're choosing to represent of this methodology within the payment to those providers. So if you have, it was referred to in one of the questions as a tick tick gap software, if you have some software solution that you're already ready to code and you currently use to pay for providers, then we can publish the list together. I mean, it should be able to be known of, well, these are the hiccups that aren't Medicare covered, and let's all propose what we think the similar service substitution should be. But yeah, the idea should be that there's there should be no proprietary millman technology that's required for you to do this. This probably would make it easier, but it's not required. Can I just uh, let me just point out? We will um, disseminate the slides after the meeting. I think this is a question on the phone, um, and we'll look at those sent out. I, I see that provider settlements and risk sharing are excluded from the Medicare denominator. Is the thought that those would also be excluded from the numerator? I don't think we've crossed that idea yet. So I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, I understand there's going to be a retrospective look. Like when validation, we're calling it. Yeah, validation. So what is the stuff? What are, what are those? How is HCA going to use those results? So they find out later that, you know, instead of 160, I'm 165. What does that mean? I don't know if we've decided any of that yet. Yeah, I'm trying to think how to, to, to factor this into my, you know, how take it back to my company for discussion. I'm not sure what that means yep. for the whole process. And why are we doing it? Maybe I'm missing something. So I had a question earlier. So I will say we have not got all the answers out to this point in the procurement development. We are bringing things earlier than we might otherwise because we don't typically expose our <laughs> thinking process along the way. But Knowing that timing is really, really critical for all of you to develop these products and get out and do some network development, we thought we should just start having conversations early, even though we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. we'll start the conversations, we can all refine them together, so we're um, building the plane together as we go. And I know that's a little bit uncomfortable, but um, we don't have a roadmap to follow on this program development. Nobody's done this yet. <laughs> Completely new guidelines for all of us. And we are hoping to get your active feedback and engagement in this conversation. If you don't feel comfortable today, then to give it later. But we have a lot of program development work still to do. And that seemed like the first part was at least to explain the methodology, get this out so you can all react to it and we can answer questions and go forward on that piece. And then we can continue to answer questions about how it is actually applied in the procurement document itself and the verification what sort of process we get through. That is the next step of questions, but getting methodology first. I just wanted to also point out, and um, you know, we, we were just coming out at the of the presentation. Um, we, before the procurement goes out, and we publicly um, shared a rough timeline. Uh, we're looking uh, late next year, but we will do a public comment. So as Michelle was mentioning, you don't want to talk today, or you know, there's, there's, this is a lot of material, and um, and so we will be doing a public comment and we'll start in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll give, you know, with the holidays, we're, we will give adequate amount of time for folks to respond. But 
but there will be a public comment and um, we really um, encourage you to respond um, to that when it comes out. And <coughs> excuse me, on the public comment, will that be on <coughs> the RFP itself or more of the methodology and the everything? everything? Um, well, not everything, everything. It's a high level description of the what we would call our policy and value based purchasing components of the procurement. So we're planning to release some of these components. So obviously the methodology is part of that, but some of the other components. But, and I apologize, I, I was assuming that this is an audience that's been following the discussions with the exchange meetings, and, and that was a, a faulty um, assumption on my part. I should have done some of the basic introduction to the program development and some of the other components that will be included, like the very collaborative requirements, and we're proposing to phase those in with a few of the recommendations and have some suggestions in the document we'll be sending out, and we welcome your feedback. Um, some reporting on the health technology assessment components, so again, to phase that in. Um, those are both required in the legislation that carriers include those recommendations. Um, just some other components like that and bridging into some of our um, common measure sets that we use mm -hmm. with all of our other programs, Medicaid, Heaven, Steph, and the linking with the measures that you already have with the health benefit exchange, the QRS, which is called the initials, right, um, to make sure that we're uniting that quality measure set. So we're looking at releasing them. Um, Kind of an outline of a yeah. matrix framework. That makes sense. Of, I mean, <clears throat> I'll just say I have um, we have actuaries on the call that are just kind of digesting this. So we'll certainly can provide feedback, whether it's through the official public comment or maybe just informally through email. Um, you know, in the near term, um, to provide feedback on specifically the methodology. We had also, <clears throat> and I guess that's the point of the public comment to provide that feedback. But I think one of the things that we'd really appreciate is I know we had submitted several questions. Um, some of which is answered in this, but a lot of them, frankly, aren't. And so I don't know if, as part of that public comment, if we submit questions, I know other carriers have as well, if we will be getting responses back to those, because some of those are kind of, as we're talking about, kind of go, no, go. That's, but some of those are waiting for responses on those. So um, I get you on our feedback, but I think it would be great if, if, if you have any additional responses, or at least got reactions to some of the questions we had, or suppose it would be really helpful too. To get responses back, and if you have any thoughts on the timeline of, of when you would have that for us, we do have some answers for you today. Great. But we should have you yeah, close out the formal presentation, and then as time allows, we can do that. Um, if there's more on the formal presentation, I call for questions on the Medicare pricing methodology. I suppose I have a question about the the difference in data quality between carriers. So if some carriers have better quality than others, how are you gonna how are you gonna adjust for the difference in data quality? For example, you said here that if the NPI is missing, you're just gonna assume it's in Seattle. So what if I had all my NPS missing and I'm just using Seattle? Obviously that would kill my results compared to people of the carriers. So if I had a carrier that was really operating the um so, so, so I, I operate in more counties than King County, but my NPI is missing, and you default to King County, so to Seattle. That was so the question. I mean. The question for those on the phone was, how are we going to consider data quality? I think data quality should be sort of one of your first core considerations on your participation in the program to begin with. So, if you don't think you're able to provide Medicare provider ID on a consistent basis across detailed claims, nor are you able to provide NPI on claims, then I think you have to consider whether your participation in the program is going to produce a result. You wouldn't want to have anyone go through the program on an entirely default basis intentionally. But the hope is that we are truly able to reprice your data and validate it against what Medicare would have paid. And I just don't think anyone would be, any of our stakeholders would be satisfied if we weren't able to make a good faith effort on that repricing. All the more reason to participate in the preliminary data call would be to assess whether your systems are able to produce data that can be repriced. Right Thank you. 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 Thank you.
give any special that says here's the similar service. Now we're a little worried that we're not going to have an exhaustive list, so there may need to be a little bit of dynamic follow up as we're going through the calendar year just to make sure we're doing a good faith effort on what that reasonably similar service is. If there's a new TICPIC code that emerges or a new procedure code that emerges, especially in the behavioral health area or something like that, then we would need to decide sort of what relative intensity we think Medicare would have paid that for. And just to add on to Rachel's comments earlier, for those that haven't participated in some of the earlier sessions, to make sure that not only are the data, the current data requests not subject to public disclosure, but they're not going to be disclosed to HCA. So if you can just repeat that. Yep. So the question was about the preliminary data calls that we issued in November. Like Rachel said earlier, that data is not subject to public disclosure. Uh, Milliman has safe harbor projection protections to be able to keep the data and use our data for the analysis. <coughs> we are, though, going to be summarizing that data. It will be blinded by any carriers that participate. But we do want to give the stakeholders at least a representative sense of what you're going through in terms of where your current levels of reimbursement were at least historically reported for 2018, where those reimbursement levels were by category of service so that we can kind of get a sense of how much of a challenge the 116% statewide goal is going to be, especially when we start to look at region by region results on the individual market. It's really hard at this point, from my perspective, to assess how much a rural region is going to be needed to be helped or, or be helping. I, I have really trouble even determining which direction it's gonna go given the amount of cost reimbursement we have in a rural area, that could potentially push up a PMPM budget on a 160% relative basis versus the urban area where you have more prospective payment, like all that sort of dynamic that we're dealing with in terms of assessing that the proposed network or networks for the public option make the overall target. You say you'll be providing results at a region level? Potentially. We don't know yet how much data we're going to get. We, we will do our utmost protection. I mean, we're, I'm an actuary, so I've got to abide by proprietary and confidential standards, just like all of the other actuaries that are helping submit the data. But I mean, the, the tables that you saw at the back of the slide deck, that's the sort of type of information, high level information at least that we think would be beneficial to inform the procurement, which is why we did the data call now, as opposed to doing the data call as a component of the procurement. To say that you're precluded from not getting a data call during the procurement as well, that still may be coming, but we wanted to try and at least get something out there initially so that we could start to size some things. And would you use the OIC reading Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about how to ask it. So um, I'm just trying to figure out the timing on this. So the data calls out. I remember in another meeting you said it would be a two to three week process to get to a carrier specific answer that we could see and then from which we could also give feedback to this methodology. Yeah. So um, and then I heard the RFP or the outline of it will come out or for public comment in two weeks or so. Okay, so I'm just like in time and space are we lining up here is my trying to figure that out. I need a calendar and a Gantt chart. You know. <laughs> uh, so we are targeting releasing sure. as been preliminary <laughs> initial draft um, outline of some of the first year policy questions. Um, this month, in the next week or two, I'm hoping it will be a preliminary draft. I'm going to say that again. Um, so that's on a separate track from the confidential conversations you're all having or choosing to have with Milliman. 
on some modeling that we can take advantage of. And I really do, I'm going to put in a plug again that it really is, I think, a great opportunity for you to participate with Milliman and get their guidance and see your own models. We won't see it, but you will. I think that would help inform your procurement response and your rating development for your, your um, product filing. But um, we obviously can't require you to participate this point it's really for your benefit more than mine. <laughs> but we are making them available for you to participate with him in that exercise. Um, so that is a slightly different track. I think the sooner that carriers participate, the better, because holidays are coming, and then it's not going to work through Christmas. I am not, but um, maybe all of you are. But uh, some of us are going to try and take a little time off for holidays before the new year begins, and our um, really big push to package all of this cascade care procurement as well as our legislative session begins. And so um, January becomes a pretty crazy season in Olympia. But not quite a calendar answer for you, but no, I get it. I fast track, and then we're hoping to release the procurement in February. So we do really need right. um, questions and feedback um, before the end of January, so that we can refine that procurement and really get to as crisp of a product as we can. Um, I have a question about the February procurement release, but I don't. If we can hold that for a minute. Do we terminate the webinar? Or we no, on? we can. Um, you can terminate it. Yeah, tomorrow. Can you please terminate the recording? And again, we we recorded this because because we wanted as a resource for folks who aren't able to come today. So when we post the public comment, they can go, they go back and listen. So that's why I just wanted to clarify why we're so focused on recording. Yeah. Um, so